Would you stand for the reading of our gospel lesson this morning? Reading from the gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's son, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got, got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. So one of the things we know to be true as disciples, uh, as people of God, as those who follow Jesus Christ, that Jesus is made known to us in the breaking of bread. It is one of the things in the Methodist Church and Christianity that we take and know to be true from our experience. That in the process of breaking bread together, when we come together at the table, Jesus Christ is made known to us. And so in this passage, the disciples have no doubt about who Jesus is because he is offering to break bread with them. He's prepared a meal, bread and fish. He's ready for them, even though they aren't ready. And in the breaking of the bread, they don't even have to ask, who are you? Today is World Communion Sunday. It's a day when uh, many churches around the world take communion on the same day. It's a day when we say we are all one body. Even though we worship different ways and different places, even though we worship uh, under different circumstances, we are one body. And so we covenant to take communion this day, World Communion Sunday, to show just how much the breaking of bread means to us and to the world. One of the ways we describe communion in the United Methodist Church is as a holy mystery. <coughs> Call it this holy mystery, this holy mystery whereby Christ's presence is made real to us as we gather at the table, as the bread is broken, as we share in the cup, that Christ is really present with us in this place, at this time, at this table. That is the holy mystery. And we say it's enough to know that Christ is present. That Christ is with us to dwell in the mystery of it, the mystery of the divine. To know that through breaking bread together, Christ is made known to us. And it's no accident that it's the breaking of bread that reveals Christ to us. Bread is 
the simplest of our meals. It was the simplest of their meals back in Jesus' time as well. It was something everybody had when they had food. It was something that would have been the main staple of their meals and life together. It wasn't extravagant. Christ is not made known to us in the breaking of filet mignon together. Right? Or lobster. Maybe in table fellowship, as an extension of this table, depending on who you're with, but this is the place where it begins. This is the holy mystery. This is the place where Christ is made present to us in the breaking of bread. He has promised it is so. And so we see Christ breaking bread with his disciples on the beach in this passage from the Gospel of John. And as we read this passage, we should be thinking about all the ways that this breaking of the bread in, in, at the last chapter in John's Gospel, the way that this breaking of the bread connects to all the other passages in John's Gospel that deal with bread. The first is the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus sees the crowd gathered and has pity on them because they're hungry. They followed him all day long. They wanted to hear what he had to say, and now they're far from home and they don't know what to do. And so the disciples find a boy who has five loaves and two fish, bread and fish. And Christ breaks the bread and prays over the meal, and it multiplies to feed five thousand. We should be thinking about the feeding of the five thousand as we read this passage today, because it tells us that there is always enough in the kingdom of God. Five loaves and two fish are enough to feed five thousand people in the kingdom of God. There is always enough in God's kingdom. And we should be thinking about Christ telling us that he is the bread of life. That's John's gospel. I am the bread of life. So when Christ breaks bread on the beach, we are thinking Christ is the bread of life. And there is always enough in God's kingdom because Christ is the bread of life. Because Christ is the source of the grace, because Christ is the source of the feeding, because Christ is the way by which our souls are nourished and fed and made ready for the task set before us as disciples. There's always enough because Christ is the bread of life. When we read this passage on the beach, Christ is breaking bread. We are thinking of Judas at the table with Christ. Where Jesus says the one who dips the bread in the bowl is the one who will betray me. What Judas shows us is that a posture of scarcity, a belief that there is not enough in this world. A belief that God can't do with what is here, with us, with the resources we have, that a belief that scarcity reigns supreme and not God's abundance in the kingdom of God. What Judas shows us is that posture of scarcity leads to betrayal. It leads to the betrayal of the mission of Christ, the mission of God. Because, you see, as far as we think Judas has gone and we could never get there, Judas represents the epitome of all the disciples' desertion and betrayal of Christ. They all flee from Christ before it is over. Judas is just the first of them because he takes it the farthest and believes that Christ's broken body is not enough. 
And when we live from that posture of scarcity, we are living in betrayal of the mission of God. You see, these stories, these three stories in John's gospel form a distinctive theme in the gospel of John which connects communion to how we operate as disciples in life in the world. They connect the bread of heaven, the bread that Christ blesses and breaks for us. They connect that bread to our life, the way we are, the who we are as disciples. Christ is made known in the breaking of bread at communion, which teaches us how there is always enough in God's kingdom to accomplish God's mission. God has promised there is enough. God has told us there is enough. God has given us enough to complete God's mission in God's kingdom. It teaches us that there's always enough in the kingdom because we are transformed by the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving meal, communion. Because we are transformed, Christ is made more present in us and in the world around us. Becoming the source of the enough, the abundance of God's grace in our lives and in the lives of all that we meet. And it reminds us that if we don't live into the abundance Christ makes real, if we don't live into the abundance that Christ has made real, real in this world through the breaking of his own body on the cross. We betray God's mission by denying God the abundance God has given us to use in God's kingdom. This story, this theme that runs through John's gospel all culminates in the passage we read this morning where Christ is revealed post-resurrection as the living God in the bread that he provides that reestablishes his mission and direction in the disciples' hearts and lives. On the beach, on the Sea of Tiberias, Christ brings the bread and breaks it and offers it to the disciples in order to reestablish who they are and whose they are in the kingdom of God. From this point forward, the disciples are living into their mission as those who serve the risen Christ. By offering them the meal that he has established, he reignites their passion for his mission. And so, in a tangible, tasteable way, communion reestablishes God's kingdom and mission and vision. God's abundance in our hearts and lives every time we celebrate it. So that we can be prepared to use what God has given us to further God's kingdom work through our church, through our families, through our workplaces, through everything that we do. That's why John Wesley encouraged us to take communion as often as we possibly could. That's why the United Methodist Church has tried to suggest that we take communion every week. Because it reestablishes who we are and whose we are. In the kingdom of God, where Christ reigns as the resurrected Lord and Savior. It shows us over and over and over again who God is and how we can find God. It helps us to reestablish that connection back to God over and over again. And over again. 
so that we can be prepared for what God has in store for us. This morning, like we said, is World Communion Sunday. And so, let's go to the table. The Lord be with you. <laughs> 